They'll be doing the time warp again. Hello, and welcome to Time Warp, 20 years of Rocky Horror. I'm Meatloaf, and I'm coming to you from the Waverly Theater in New York City, where the Rocky Horror Picture Show gained a lot of its popularity back in the 70s. Tonight, we're here celebrating the 20th anniversary of the most outrageous movie spoof known as the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I, of course, have a very special place in my heart for Rocky Horror, since the role of Eddie was my film debut. <laughs> Well, you can't talk about Rocky Horror without a little gender bending. After all, the thrust of the story centers around a transvestite from the planet transsexual trying to take over the Earth with his fellow Transylvanians. But wait a second, I'm getting real ahead of myself. Before we get into all that sex stuff, let's find out about how all this insanity started. It was great when it all began. It all began in 1972 when Richard O'Brien started pursuing the possibility of creating a horror-based musical. While working on another project, he found himself writing the script, music, and lyrics for what would become the Rocky Horror Show. I wrote a song called Science Fiction Double Feature. At the same time, I started to get the glimmerings of an idea of a, of, a, of a musical and thought this song would be very good as a prologue to the whole piece and kick it off. The play was very sort of tacky and sleazy. We all had holes in our fishnets and the makeup was sort of messy and it was, you know, very, very low budget situation. And, uh, and of course, when we did the film, it definitely got a bit more glamorous. <laughs> When casting for the film version of the play, American producer Lou Adler saw no reason for drastic changes in London's Rocky Horror show or cast. When we made the deal for the film, we decided that we would use as many people as possible from the play because they had been doing it for so long, and a lot of them had some of that kind of experience. How'd you do, I? See you've met my faithful hand in hand. For example, Tim Curry, there was never any doubt that we would not have made the film if we had to go with someone else. Meatloaf we picked up out of the Los Angeles production, um, and he just was Eddie, you know, and he was perfect for it. Susan showed right away that she um, understood the character. You're too kind. She had that look, she had that uh, very sort of naive look, except she could be very sensual. Damn it, Janet, I love you. I, I don't think Boswick was worried about always being a nerd, you know, I mean, he was acting the part. Um, if any of them, it was Tim, uh, Tim Curry. Um, his was the most outrageous. Um, his was uh, the most that could be, that a stigma could be attached to. Oh, rock here. Well, you know, the first thing that uh, takes you, the first wave, you know, the first time anybody actually notices that you're alive is pretty important. Um, that's terrific, and it's also kind of weird. My God, I can't stand any more of this. You show people up, and then you spit them out again. I think that Tim is really the main person that had to bear that cross because he was so much the star of it. It's not easy having a good time. Me, well, I think, I mean, I don't think it hasn't affected my career, although obviously I haven't had the, the success that they've had. I loved you. Do you hear me? I loved you. And what did it get me? Yeah, I'll tell you, a big nothing. I mean, it, it certainly hasn't hurt Susan's career at all. You know, that's the strange theor thing about the body of my work is that it appeals to lots of different pockets of people, and I'm sure there are a lot of people that love the client that didn't have the faintest idea that I was also in Pretty Baby or Rocky Horror Show. Yeah, I don't think it did a damn thing for my career one way or the other. <laughs> It was 
bizarre attempt at making probably Sound of Music in 1975, you know. Sound of Music in, of course, fishnet tights and you know, six-inch high heels, but nobody would look at that performance in that movie and say, gee, wouldn't he be a great Hamlet, you know? So let the party in the sound rock on. We're gonna shake it till the light has gone, gone, gone. Close to my world, keep me safe from my trouble and pain. You know, those are really, really heady times for the cast of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now, for many of us, it was our first big screen break, which was always exciting. But for the more seasoned performers, I think it was just stimulating to be part of that project. And to say the least, it was a little different from other films. The conditions are the English countryside, you know. It's, uh, it rained a lot, and uh, it was dark a lot. Um, it was an old house that we were shooting in. You're all wet. Yes, it's raining. Well, I caught pneumonia for the first time when I when I was doing it because there was no heat. We had to drive an hour to a studio that had no heat, and they tried to bring space heaters, and then the, because we were running around wet and half naked all the time. Oh, oh, Brad! It's all right, Janet. We'll play along for now and pull out the aces when the time is right. Oh, oh, oh! Slowly, slowly. It's so nice to dump the rush. It was cold, you know. It was, we were always wet. We were always cold. Brad Majors. This is my fiance, Janet Weiss. Weiss. We were younger and we had, we were proud enough of our bodies. You know, we weren't shy about all that. So, so it was, uh, it was, it was uh, sort of deliciously uh, exhibitionistic. You know. I also had never sung before, and I was one of the reasons I took the film was to get over my phobia about singing. I, I would open my mouth and I was so terrified, nothing would come out. Tell me, tell me, me. We can walk it was a good lesson for me in ego involvement and trying to get rid of this phobia I had about singing. Um, and it was very hard. One of the amazing things I, that I found, I, I, a very therapeutic kind of learning curve for me, was I went into the um, into one of the rehearsal rooms in the big house that we had, and they were rehearsing the time warp with all the Transylvanians. And the strange thing about that was, even the Barry and Susan standing amongst this disparate group of 20 people, so varied in, in, in physical protoplasmic kind of way, were, were as freakish as, as anybody else. It's hard to to create that balance of you know overacting, you know, and acting and, and reality. It's just a jump to the left. That was always a, a fine balancing act amongst us all. It had been a it had been a really good time for me, you know.
In the spring of 1975, filming of the Rocky Horror Picture Show was completed. And a few months later, in July, producer Lou Adler organized a preview of the film for the movie's distributors. It received an anemic response from the studio and most of the moviegoers, with the exception of a few who believed that the film had real potential. You've seen all kinds of movies, but you've never seen anything like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. We had made a film that we liked, but no one liked it. Tim Deegan, who was at that time a very um, fairly new and certainly young executive in marketing at uh, Fox, is, uh, who said to me, I don't like the film. And I said, great, you can be objective about it then. He said, if somebody's telling me the truth, you're the only person I want to deal with. And it just, the, the connection started right there. I went to New York and I made a, uh, I had a meeting with the Walter Reed Theaters, which owns the Waverly, and made a tentative arrangement with them. He called this man called uh, Bill Quigley and uh, told him that he had his next midnight hit for him. And Rocky Horror replaced Night of the Living Dead. And, uh, at midnight, April Fool's Weekend, 1976. And to this day, it's still playing somewhere at midnight all over the world. I was one of those people, if I really liked the movie, I went to see it over and over and over again. And I don't know, the lips came up on the screen and uh, I was hooked from that minute on. Michael Remy was there all the day the earth stood still. But he told us where we stand. My name is Sal Piero and I'm president of the National Rocky Horror Picture Show Fan Club. Tonight's going to be my 425th time seeing this film. The group of us who started a lot of this participation, we formed the fan club. And I was at that time elected president of the fan club, and I kept the fan club alive for the last 18 and a half years. And now the, the fan club is actually supported by the studio, and I run the fan club. Give me an Give me an Midnight screenings of the Rocky Horror Picture Show became a totally different experience once the element of audience participation was introduced. Sal Pirro remembers how one moviegoer responded to the film in a very vocal way. There was this great man who had this great voice named Lewis, and just as Janet was walking in the rain with this newspaper on her head, he yelled out, I don't take it personally at all when they call me a bitch. I think it's really funny, and I, I probably called Janet a bitch too. You know, I, I, I like the idea that there was this really sweet ingenue, and underneath she really was a bitch. So they're completely right. I like that. I mean, I think that's fun. I mean, to me, I, that's that's affectionate, you know. And uh, my father gets a little upset when when people refer to him as uh, Af father, you know. But uh, he'll get over it. I would like. intentionally so they can say their own dialogue. That's, that's a, a kind of myth as well. <laughs> it is impossible to do a retrospective look at the Rocky Horror Picture Show without asking the question, who are the fans? Who are these people who keep returning midnight after midnight, dressed like their favorite character, singing all the songs and talking back to the screen? Well, let's just say they're not your average Broadway theater crowd. <laughs> trying not to be normal. To be normal is like irregular. And so like we're the people who are going to run this country someday. Because they're mimicking a, a movie, it becomes acceptable to them. God knows what their parents say. Doreen, I told you not to wear that outfit one more time. I had to run in and uh, grab some pantyhose before I left and my family's not too comfortable with it, but it's okay. 
when I talk to kids and I ask them, you know, especially the people that have been going for years and years and years, they would say, you know, as long as they're kids that are lonely or feel on the outside or whatever, the Rocky Horror Show will, will be there for them. Don't get strong out by the way I look. Don't judge a book by cover. Welcome to my day world. I'm not much of a man by the lot of day. I've been filling away and handling customers uh, at Stagecraft for two and a half years. I, I do enjoy creating anything, but um, I wouldn't say that my main talents lie with, with uh, um, sewing or uh, repairing costumes.
on its cast and fan. Even with its campy outrageousness and its extravagantly sexy tone, many agree that it's still around today because of its everlasting charm. I'm not sure why the film survives. It has an enormous amount of energy, but I, I, I think that probably it has more to do with the message that um, not to dream it, but to be it. Don't dream it. for what you want. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Okay, kids, that's it. We've done the time warp. But you know what? Rocky Horror is still so popular and so many people are still showing up in theaters singing all those songs and pretending to be all those characters. I have a feeling that we're going to be back here in the year 2005 doing the time warp once again. So till then, you keep rocking. Don't dream it, be it, and have a great time. Happy 25th anniversary to everybody. Oh, sorry, 20th. <laughs> uh, I'm expecting of the 20th anniversary. No, 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 no. We get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. Here we go. Relax. Gee, you couldn't get you couldn't get Dan Rather to do it this quick. And it's the VH1 Board of Directors. I hope at the 20th anniversary there's more people dressed up like Brad Majors and a few more men dressed up like Brad Majors. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear 